Uh, my name's Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. If you don't already do so, you can also follow us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and also our YouTube channel. Tonight, we are so ecstatic to welcome back Miriam Tabes and Laura Vandenberg. From Miriam Tabes, the best-selling author of Women Talking and All My Puny Sorrows, comes a compassionate and darkly humorous new novel about three generations of women. When Swiv is temporarily kicked out of school, her grandma gives her an assignment to write a letter to her absent father. Swib's assignment to grandma is to write a letter to Gord, her unbo unborn grandchild and Swib's brother or sister. You are a small thing, grandma writes to Gord, but you must learn to fight. Grandma has been fighting all her life. Brought up in a strictly religious community, she has fought the people who wanted to take away her joy, her independence, and her spirit. She has fought to protect her family, and she's fought, fought to make peace with her loved ones when they have chosen to leave her. Swib's mother, too, is fighting on every front, as grandma, as grandma puts it, internally, externally. Fight Night is a love letter to the mothers and grandmothers who have raised us and to all the women who know what it costs to live in this world, but who are still finding a way, painfully, ferociously, to live on their own terms. Miriam joins us tonight from Toronto. And joining Miriam in conversation tonight is Laura Vandenberg. She's the author of five works of fiction, including The Third Hotel, a finalist for the New York Public Library Young Lions Fiction Award, and I Hold a Wolf by the Ears, which was one of Time Magazine's 10 best fiction books of 2020. Her numerous awards include the Bard Fiction Prize and a Pin O, o, o Henry Award. And in 2021, Laura was awarded both the Strauss Living Award for the American, from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and a Guggenheim Fellowship in Fiction. And we thank her for being part of tonight's event. She's joining us from New York. This evening's event includes an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen for the questions. And if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer of, you can actually upvote that question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, please consider supporting Miriam and Powell's by purchasing a copy of her new book from us. A link to buy Fight Night, as well as a link to buy Laura's books, will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Miriam, Laura, we're so, so excited to have you uh, with us tonight. It's great to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's Hi, so Laura. wonderful to be here. Hi, Miriam. Hi, everyone out in the ether, in the ether. Um, hello. yes hello ether um thank you for for being with us and thank you to pals for hosting um miriam it's so good to see you i'm so excited to talk about this amazing book so great to see you too laura <laughs> um all right so we have limited time so i thought we would just dive dive right in um i wanted to start if i may by asking you about swiv um Fight Night's terrifically electric live wire nine-year-old um, guide. How did you arrive on her as a narrator and what attracted you to filtering this story through the lens of childhood? Mm, I think there were, um, there were a number of reasons. I think when I, was, when I was thinking about the book, you know, a few years ago and, and trying to I don't know, just try to figure out a way, a way in and, and who would be the narrator. Um, well, I had kind of thought that, you know, I, I started having grandchildren actually. And I thought, oh, I, I would like to write, you know, a book um, for my grandchildren. Um, ho hopefully, you know, it would appeal to others as well. But I had, I had them in mind and um, I knew that I wasn't writing a kid's book necessarily. But um, I also knew that I wanted to write um, I, w I wanted to write about a person and to my mind, that person would, you know, very, very likely be a, a kid um, who was sort of on the cusp again between innocence and, and experience in a way. I mean, Swiv is nine years old. So on the, on the one hand, you know, she sort of looks at, at things 
in a, in a literal way and um, in a very frank and, and um, kind of, you know, child, a child's perspective on, on the world and, and her observations. But, you know, but she also has the beginnings of, you know, so much anxiety mm -hmm. and worry and concern about, you know, about the world, about herself, about um, what she may have inherited. Um, she, she's, she's just a very anxious person. And I thought that in order to get across, I, I know I'm rambling and I'll try and, you know, <laughs> wrap up this answer, but the, 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 I thought, I thought a way of looking at some of the darker stuff that Swib is looking at, you know, for instance, this kind of, um, inherited mental illness, um, and the possibility of her also having it, um, and of her mother having it, um, would be something that would be, it would just be, but it would just be less, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, less kind of um, intense or um, less um, sentimental or less, uh, you know, mm, you know, a sort of coming from uh, a kid's perspective, a, a sort of sideways, you know, look into that, into that kind of fear and that kind of anxiety so that it could be also comic. Um, even though there's the dark, you know, the dark implications beneath the, the comedy. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That makes so much sense. And I, I was thinking when you mentioned um, the like frankness of children, that that's also can be a quality sometimes that we see in older people, right? Who are on the opposite end of the life continuum where they've reached a point where they're just totally like unvarnished. Um, yeah, exactly. yeah, my mom at, you know, almost 80, it's like... <laughs> you ask her opinion for something like you should be prepared to really hear what she thinks. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, so, I mean, I, I think of um, Swiv and her grandmother being very much kind of like the, you know, the beating central heart of this, of this book. Um, and, and they're on very different ends of the life continuum, but also in some ways there are these kind of commonalities. Um, and Fight Night is, is a very intergenerational -gener novel with Swiv and her mother, and her grandmother all under one roof. And I was so compelled by the way that knowledge kind of flows downstream and that um, Swoop's grandmother, of course, has a lot to teach her and actually kind of takes over her education in an unorthodox way after um, Swoop is expelled from school for fighting. And I, I think just as an aside, like one of my favorite um, lessons was how to dig a grave in winter, yeah. um, which is amazing. Uh, but also knowledge flows like in the other direction where there are things that Swift has to offer her grandmother. So like all three of these characters in their way are teaching each other how to live. And you had mentioned this book in some ways kind of growing out of your relationship um, to, to your own grandchildren. But I'm wondering if you could just tell us um, more about what moved you to gather three generations of women together for this story. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's kind of, you know, another chapter in the in the big book The you know, I kind of like think of all of my books as sort of one, you know, giant book about <laughs> similar, yeah. similar themes, <laughs> similar characters. But um, in this case, you know, um, I'm living with a bunch of generations, my mother, I'm living so my mother is in the house. Um, you know, my, my daughter and her children are in the house. My partner and I are in a little house called the Laneway house here in Toronto in, in the backyard. So there are four generations of us all under this roof. So, you know, naturally that, um, you know, influenced me and, um, and I wanted to write about, you know, that, that dynamic and, and the interplay of that. There are some, some uh, men uh, and, you know, male children living here as well. So <laughs> 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 we won't leave them out entirely. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they're, they're a wonderful, uh, you know, addition for sure. But, uh, but, but yeah, you know, I wanted to focus on, on the three generations of women and, yeah. you know, how their lives kind of, you know, affect um, each other and, and how they, and how that all plays out, how they survive. Yeah. And Swift's, am I correct that Swift's grandmother, Elvira, shares the name of your mother? Yeah. 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 It's the same name. You know, it's funny because when I was writing, I mean, I, you know, I have names, you know, fictional names for my characters, my fictional characters. Um, and when I was writing the grandma character, um, it just occurred to me that really, I mean, so much of it was straight from 
my own mother, not all of it, obviously, as you know, you know of course, kind of yeah. Cash of, of um, facts and fiction, but, but, um, but yeah, and I just, it just, I just, it just seemed right to just call the character Elvira after, after yeah. you know, my own, my own mother. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I'm, I'm wondering, like, if you can tell us more um, about that process of transforming sort of lived experience into fiction, because it's, you know, I know we all come at this differently, but thinking of my own experience, at least as a as a fiction writer, it's, you know, our our lived experiences can can be such a powerful sort of um, generator of story, and is often where like the heat really is. Um, and also, I do feel like there has to be this sort of strange, you know, in sort of elusive process where um, the fact kind of leaps into another dimension and is allowed to take on the sort of elasticity of a fiction. Um, and I, yeah, I just would love to hear more about what is, what is that process? What is that process like for you? Are you thinking consciously about sort of creating daylight between lived experience and, you know, written narrative, or, or is that process just simply something that happens, you know, very organically? Um, that's a really good question, Laura. Like you said, it's an elusive process. process. It's it very, is. It's very yeah. difficult, isn't it? Yeah. To, find, to kind of just describe sort of what happens, you know, in that, in that, um, whatever it is, alchemy or, or a synthesis or whatever. Um, it's, it is, I mean, it is conscious. It absolutely, I mean, you know, I mean, the stuff that we keep going to, you know, going to and going to, you know, circling around the themes, the big questions, these, the things that we remember. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's such an interesting um, kind of, kind of process because, you know, the, on the one hand, we're taking, I'm taking this stuff, you know, some of the stuff, I mean, it's a sort of sel selective, um, you know, culling of experience and emotions and, and, um, and, and using that in service, I guess, to the themes that I've already established at the beginning of the, uh, at the beginning of the book, or at least in my mind, maybe not so much in the book, but, you know, so, so, so then, you know, those will sort of meet, you know, together with, with the structure, which is a, yeah. obviously an artificial structure. I mean, the way that, you know, a book, a narrative, the story is structured in the book is, is different from how real life, you know, plays out, right? I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a concentrated thing. So, so um, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's um, certainly, I don't feel bound to the, to the, the, the so-called truth or the or the facts I mean you know as as you know and as we continue yeah. to say and everybody says all our lives I mean we're looking for a truth in fiction um you know that's that's there you know so um so kind of um in a, in a larger than life truth that we can get through you know writing 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 fiction in a sense and it's yeah. um and that's what I'm and so you know the the combination of fact and fiction of things that are you know directly taken from life and the things that are made up you know they have to go they have they have to work together but you know it's it's, it's that selection process the decisions that we make as we as we write you know every every mm -hmm. paragraph every scene and um I don't know I mean I'm curious to know how you <laughs> like how would you describe that process yeah I I think I have you here I think you gave a beautiful description. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know that I could, I could improve upon it necessarily. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's strange because it's both like conscious and unconscious sort of at the same time. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think that that thing about, um, I mean, I think that there are a lot of necessary paradoxes in writing fiction and sort of what you're talking about with the like artificial structure, right? And, and the kind of artifice and the way that it can um, collide with lived experience and it can generate this sort of truth that is somehow um, bigger than what the facts could generate. Um, and I think that that, yeah, that that, so it's sort of like, I feel like, and again, I'm not doing this and it sounds like you're not either in this kind of very um, 
strategic or calculating way, but somewhere in the brain, I feel like there must be this kind, you know, colander, if you will, that's sort of filtering through the lived experience for those dimensions that will create that kind of special collision with like the artificial structure that we have in mind. Um, that's yeah. sort of, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's those two threads, like those two sort of rivers coming together, you know, joining. Yeah, the yeah. Sort of when you're rolling, so you work like two parts of your brain. I don't know if it's left and right, but certainly two parts of the mind or the memory or the brain or the intellect or whatever it is that it that, and um, you know, or when you're rolling um dough, you know, and you're rolling it and you're using the thing to roll it and you know the shape that you're it's supposed to you know eventually take, but you're adding you know flour, you know, you're just right. adding handfuls of flour, yeah. sort of randomly throwing it in there. You know, the flour is the kind of you know the stuff that you remember from life, just and the and the rolling of the dough. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. The rolling, the rolling of the dough is, you know, because it, I mean the structure of the thing. It's so important, right? The I mean, rolling pin is the that rolling, yeah, rolling pin the and, and make it. You know, it has to fit into the pie plate. I mean, you know, <laughs> it can't have holes in it, you know, because you have to fill it up with fruit or whatever. But to make a pie, but but um, I don't even know what I'm saying. But but um, you know, it's just that combination, and and it's the artfulness. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. we're trying to create art. We're trying to create something that's artful but that's some, something that's you know um so we're working through things I'm working through something um, yeah, when, when I write you know and so that working through um things necessarily re requires you know certain ingredients I'll stick with this dough thing you know from <laughs> from, from real life you know from mm -hmm. from lived experience you know that fills in you know the 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 artificial structure yeah I think I'm probably repeating myself now but <laughs> speaking of the pie plate that's a good, <laughs> beautiful segue into another question that I had about um form uh and this this novel is framed um as a letter to Swift's uh, absent father and that gives us kind of like the loose you know shape and sort of pr parameters for um fight night and also I mean Apart from that kind of macro structure, I was really struck by how letters. Um, this came through in the, the um, you know introduction to Fight Night, but that how um, letters in general play like a significant role in the book. Like letters are written to you know Swift's unborn sibling, um, you know, et cetera. Um, uh, Swift at one point writes a narrative about her you know her grandmother's life. Um, so this this idea of the importance of um, documenting experience, documenting personal history through, you know, writing feels like a really important through line in the novel. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to know, just sort of, I'd love to hear you talk about the book's form and, and did you always have that, that kind of loose frame, that epistolary frame in mind for Fright Night? Um, or do you, are these things that you kind of figure out through the writing itself? Mm -hmm. I think um, I, th I think it was something that I figured out through the through the writing itself, and certainly through the the note taking process that comes before the actual writing. Um, the I had always wanted to write an epistolary novel, and had, and I've tried mm -hmm. so so many times. And this one is you know it's some it it is letters, but it's um, I had tried, and and I just I just it it hadn't ever worked for me, and and um and so you know I thought okay I'll I'll try again, and I had always wanted to write from you know kids um, perspective as well, and so those two things those were the big the big challenges how am I going to combine these two things, and so, um you know it the, I feel that the letter form, is something that. It just to write to write a letter. It just kind of gives the impression, anyway, um, of uh, honesty, like just a pure, mm -hmm. direct spilling out of one's, you know, heart and soul, and saying this, this is, you know, that this is a thing. And obviously, that's not necessarily true. I mean, we compose letters and we think about letters and we craft them and we and we and we write them and send them off or we don't send them but you know but for for my purposes it was a way it was a chance to to see the characters a little bit more fully you know um because of course if it's if everything is from swiv the nine-year-old's perspective you know that that gives a certain kind of um perspective obviously you know maybe exaggerated maybe a little zany maybe a little you know um 
troubled. Um, she's she's a troubled kid. I mean, she's she's tough. She's got you know that bullshit bravado kind of thing going mm -hmm. on. But she's you know she's freaked out by a lot of things. And and um, so the the letters, you know, I guess it was yeah. You know, I thought okay, here's a chance we can see sort of a little bit more of the of you know the, gr the grandma and and mom too. And um, and letters are just something that I always feel for myself. Um, there's just been so many times in my life where I knew that I should be writing letters. I should, I feel that I should have written a letter to this mm. person or that person, to my children, to my mother, to my late sister, to whomever it is, you know, where I should have written letters and I didn't. And so in a, in a sense, this was, you know, even though the letters aren't from me, they're from, you know, my characters, it was, it was kind of, I don't know, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a good thing to do. And the, and the, that line, um, I mean, it was a good thing for me to have done. And, and um, the, the line, you know, you're, you're a small thing and you must learn to fight yeah. was something that really, and I know this sounds so hokey, and I hope that this sort of thing has happened to you, probably has, but it just really, you know, I think I was having a nap um, and on my son's couch and I woke up and it was just that, that line that was in, yeah. in my head that came to me. And I don't know if I dreamt it or if it's you know some sort of lucid dreaming situation but and I thought okay you know that's kind of okay that will be you know part of grandma's letter yeah yes that has absolutely ha that usually happens to me in the car which is um wor worrisome because I'm already something of a dis distracted driver and that just makes me more so thankfully right now I'm in a rural part of New York so there's not a lot of traffic I just have to watch for like deers and cattle um but that yeah that's oh thank you so much that was such a um beautiful and expansive answer and yeah I agree I mean I think anything you know, in a letter, it's sort of like, because you're writing, there is that sort of implicit um, or not in, or explicit audience for the character and like that one-to-one, -one, there's something about that, that I think that there's this instant sort of intimacy and urgency, yeah. right? Like you're not going to write down stuff that you don't care about. You're going to write down stuff that matters to you. Um, and I, I really, I love the way that that sort of intensifies um this the story in a really cool way because i think uh, you know with swiv i mean there's a certain element of it's not performance on her part necessarily but if she's writing you know she's she's writing to her absent father and um you know she misses him she needs him she she you know she she doesn't know where he is and why he's left and um you know so so her you know, when she's writing about her life with her, with her mother and with her grandma, there's an element of, um, there's, um, like I said before, that, that a little bit of that bravado or that sort of, uh, you know, composition, almost, it, almost a, um, a seductive way, a sort of element of saying like, look, you know, th this is what's happening and I'm going to not necessarily exaggerate this, this scene, but I'm going to make it as, you know, interesting or as compelling as I can because I want you to to look at this and I want you to want this too and I want you to come yeah, back yeah, and I want you to yeah, experience this and be here with us you know and so yeah. when you get to the letters like grandma writes and, and mom writes yeah. like you say it's more of an intimate you know sort of frank kind of you know real um mm -hmm. and and personal really I mean sure they're they're in a novel you know yeah. but, but you know when you when you write them when I wrote them you know yeah. you can think of them as a real kind of private correspondence right and yeah. and that you know and then and then it, and then it has that intimacy and that that real you know light shone on on you know the yeah. inner the inner lives of these of these women yeah absolutely um I wanted to, I've been, as it's in the title, right? So like this idea of fighting back um, and learning to fight and what that means, the many, many different things that it can mean is, is another like very central through line um, in the novel. And it just is this, I, I, for me, it was this really powerful meditation on um, resilience and survival and what it means to fight back against injustice and grief and all the forces in the world that are, conspiring to destroy us. Um, and I think in, in the case of this book, like especially conspiring to destroy like women specifically. Um, and at one point in the novel, I, I just had this quote written down um, 
Swift tells us that grandma and mom argue about grandma giving things away, but grandma says after the doctors killed almost everyone she loved, she had to ask herself how she would survive grief. And her answer was, who can I help? Um, and then at another point, um, Elvira says that fighting can be making peace, fighting can be going small. And so I was, I thought one thing that was so interesting is just like the really multifaceted and, you know, sometimes surprising manifestation, um, the, the very different manifestations that Fighting Back takes um, over the course of the book. And I just love to hear you talk about what you were interested in expressing or exploring um, about resilience and, and fighting back in this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, um, there's so many, there's so many different levels. I think, at, you know, when I started thinking about this book, I, I felt that I was in a, so, so many fights and, you know, not, not, you know, not physical fights, not, you know, King of the Hill, King of the Castle, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> like, with, you know, the thing that she's um, expelled for, but, but, but just fights, you know, just internally with my, with myself against these types of things, like you said, that, you know, the things that will, that will, I mean, we say that, that can, that might destroy us, but really, I mean, in, in reality, that, that will destroy us, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in the end, <laughs> it will, will be gone, you know, and, and, um, and, and I felt, I guess, you know, that, that there was, there were so many of those types of, I'm not sure what you call them, existential fights or these sort of inner, you know, some kind of combat with, with the world on a certain level, but, you know, also with the types of personal things with that, you know, with, with the idea, this idea of um, in, inherited madness. I like, I like yeah. to, you know, with the idea of death, of mortality, of, of loneliness, of, of sickness, of um, trying to take care of my, you know, my, my mother. And also, you know, with the births of my grandchildren, mm -hmm. looking at them and saying, okay, you know, this welcome to the world, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're so happy to have you, but watch out, you know, yeah. and it, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, as we know, and so there were all these things going on. And then when I thought of the, you know, that, that just, I thought too, I thought, okay, this book could sort of be a compendium. That was the word that I had in my mind is a compendium of fights, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, you know, it needs to be more than just a, a list of, of fights, but in a sense, there is that, there is that element to it. And fight night itself refers to a specific, um, you know, scenario, specific set of circumstances, you know, stuff that happens to them, to the mother and it's, and it's grandma, it's grandma, you know, talking to Swiv about this. And she says fight night. And I like the idea too, of the, of the, of the word night in it, you know, with, which to me sort of implies the, you know, or sort of gives the, the impression of the fight, you know, being put, put to bed, you yeah. know, like, you know, <laughs> fades black, you know, the fight, the fight we can we can surrender we can we can give up the fight and um and we can and and we and we can and we can you know we can we can stop and we can make that decision for ourselves and and i mean the, the whole idea of fighting in terms of um my my background where i come from you know pacifism being you know this central tenet of the mennonite faith which is you know what i what i come from i mean you know it just there's there's so much um i don't know kind of danger danger in the in the word fight in the idea of fighting mm -hmm. in the necessity of you know of of fighting and and you know fighting for survival fighting for our voice fighting for our place fighting for agency fighting for safety you know in terms of certainly you know girls and women in the world yeah yeah, yeah absolutely um i i'm I think I have one more question to ask you. Um, well, I have many more questions to ask you, but I also want to not uh, allow space for the questions that our, our lovely our lovely audience in the ether might want to ask you. But I have I have one that I think is kind of related to what you were just talking about. Um, but I, I, I do want to remind our lovely audience in the ether that if you have questions for Miriam, please put them in the Q&A area and then I will, um, we, 
I will read, I can read them to Miriam or you, you can look at what, however we want to do it, but, um, okay, but okay, we'll look, yeah, yeah. I apologize for being such a, a Luddite. Yeah. I will we will, to- we will get to them. We, we will get to them, get to them shortly. So this would, but this would be a good time to start um, putting those questions in the chat. Uh, just thinking about like the many different shapes fighting and resilience can take. I mean, one of the things that I love about your work is how the rawest pain and the deepest grief is met very often with this soul shaking humor. Um, And I remember I had this experience. I was so, I mean, I felt this way about everything that I've read of yours, Miriam, but um, with all my puny sorrows, I actually, would say the title and would start crying, but then I would be like, it's an amazing book. It was like, it's really funny (laughs) to say, you know, it was just, but I was so like, I was so moved by the book. It was, I I had struggled to, you know, to to talk about it without becoming sort of over overcome, um, you know, right after I had finished it. And yet, you know, one of the first things I would say to, as I was trying to, you know, foist it on, another person was, I was like, and it's hilarious. Um, and, and, but the, you know, these, but these qualities are not, um, mutually exclusive, of course. And I think, you know, without delving into spoiler territory in fight night, there is this one hospital scene near the end that had me like howling and weeping in glorious, um, simultaneity. And I think, the really incredible thing, because this sort of maybe superficial reading would be if you're going to um, delve into difficult material, we need to give our readers a sort of release valve. But I, I don't think that that's, I don't, that's not how I experience the humor in your work. Like it's not just um, a way to sort of release some pressure from the story, but it really does feel like a tool sur- tool for survival and, and like an act of resilience and an act of resistance. Um, and I'm wondering if you, what, what is your, you know, what is your relationship to humor? Like, do you see it in the same way or do you, do you see it differently? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not, you're, you're right. I mean, it's not, you know, they're, they're not um, um, diametrically opposed, the humor or the dark, you know, the tragedy, the comedy, the lightness and the dark. I mean, and it's like, they're, you know, but it's, it's all, it is a tool. Humor is a tool for survival. Um, it's not just used as a distraction um, from, from, you know, from, from the difficult reality, from the sadness. Uh, from the tragedy but um, it's a different it's a it's a different direction it's a different angle it's a different way of looking um, with wide open eyes you know um, directly at um, you know at, at 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 the darkness and dragging something into the light you know and something that we can observe in a different way because we need you know we need to keep our eyes on on this on on the dark stuff you know, whatever you want to call it in life, Um, you know, the sadness, the tragedy, the the difficulties, and um, and we can't always, it just doesn't seem human, it doesn't seem natural, we can't always be looking at it, you know, with, with, with seriousness. Mm -hmm. Um, Certainly, we, we do need to do that. But I feel that, you know, when we look at it from a slant, from a different direction, from a humorous um, perspective, uh, you know, we're, we're able to learn a lot more um, about it and about what we're up against and about how we're going to, how we're going to sur- survive it. And, um, and I know that it, to, to the humor, it's not a, it's not a, a conscious kind of thing in, in, in my work. It's more just a sort of the way that I see uh, the world as a, as a funny place, as a, as a terrifying place and a dark place and a tragic place, but also a very funny place an absurd place and a ridiculous mm. place. <laughs> and, yeah. and um, you know, it's, um, it, I, th- I feel like I've always had this role in my family, I think, and, you know, as being kind of a provider of, you know, this was just the dynamic. This was just sort of the thing set at the beginning, like every family, you know, we have our kind of job <laughs> in the sense, yeah, yes. you know, and it was the provider of, you know, um, jokes maybe or humor um and um of of you know this desperate attempt to make um members of my family laugh um but genuine laughter um or even not laughter but you know just to find something funny just that feeling in, inside and 
to have that feeling when you do find something funny. I think it just gives us such strength and such mm -hmm. courage. Yeah, I think genuine laughter has like a measure of truth to it too, right? And that's the that's the difference between, yeah, or even absurdity has a measure of, of truth to it. And, and so, yeah, it also seems like another kind of channel for getting at that bigger, bigger truth that fiction is able to, to activate. Yeah, and I think humor too, it sort of serves this role as, you, you know, kind of takes you into a broader thing, a broader, uh, like a life a view, uh, um, you know, where when we're when we're consumed um, with the with the darker stuff, and when we can't see any humor, when we can't get to that place where we can possibly laugh or at least find something funny, um, you know, it just it just closes in on us. And I think humor takes us to a place where we go, okay, we're all, um, in a sense, we're all in in this together. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, life is difficult. Life is suffering. Yeah. Um, you know, we're all going <laughs> to die, we're all going to lose, we're all going to, you know, su <laughs> suffer and fail, etc. all of those things. And, you know, if when you go to a, a, a different way of looking at it, the humorous place, which isn't the only way of looking at it, obviously, um, but it, but it, it, it connects us, I think, to, you know, mm -hmm. to, to humanity in, in a way that is so comforting. Yeah, that feels so right. I mean, I think in some ways, it's like, it's a bit of like, um, stepping out of the individual situation or not even stepping out of, but like kind of looking up from our own plate of woe and sort of connecting to like the cosmic condition um, yeah. of being like a human being moving through space and time. Yeah. 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 I love yeah. That. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. We have a question in the chat. Um, I'm happy to to just read it um, if that if that is is acceptable. Um, but this is um, about how would you compare the word fight to the word resistance? Would your characters choose one concept over the other? Oh well, what a good question. I mean, fight resistance. I love I love. I love the word resistance. Um, I, you know, it's so it's so interesting because I sometimes come at it from kind of a religious, um, you know, point of view or perspective, in, in a sense, because of how you know how how I grew up and and um, you know this idea of resistance, but you know, in conflict with the idea of, of turning one's cheek, of just um, you know resist of the idea of resisting through peace you know, like non-resistance being resistance in a sense, mm -hmm. um, you know, giving by, you know, by not resisting, I mean, we're given a certain, I'm not sure what it is. I don't know uh, if it's human dignity or some form, some bizarre strength, I'm, I'm not sure. But on the other hand, you know, there's so much that we do need to resist and to know when to, you know, to know the difference. You know, what are, what are those things, like the thing that my grandmother had embroidered on her <laughs> wall god yeah give me the strength to know what, I know what you mean yes you know what? <laughs> the yeah the like cross stitches yeah the, yeah the something or other the courage to change what i can change or the serenity to accept what i can't um you know so it's so i mean it's it's a complex concept for me the idea of fighting and re and and resistance and it's something that i think about an awful lot um mm -hmm you know, and, 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 and how we, how we conserve our energy and how we move forward and, and, and how we choose our fights. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we have another, uh, this is not a question, but, uh, a, more of a comment, uh, but a lovely comment, um, not a question, but what I find remarkable and so, so admirable about your use of humor in the midst of pain and sorrow is that your humor is not dark in itself, but carries with it so much love and compassion. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and that is from Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Go ahead. Oh no! I I mean just 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 to just to respond, you know, to to that. Um, well, I don't know what my response is to that. It wasn't it wasn't a question. It was a it was a beautiful statement that I I really appreciate. Um, and it's it you know, it's something I think you know moving in a love, moving in a love direction. I guess is is um something that 
goes along with a fight. You know, we can fight some fights because, you know, for for because of the love that we feel for the people that we're fighting for, <clears throat> you know, or you know, or for ourselves. I mean, I think they're kind of, you know, sort of again entwined fighting and love and passion and compassion. Anyway, again, I'm rambling. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that is that's wonderful. I like to talk about love and humor. Yeah. It's two of my favorite subjects. We are a hundred percent we are a hundred percent here for it. All all the love and humor talk. <laughs> it's good to um, love and humor. I mean in this world of all the things that we can experience. <laughs> this this is yeah, love and humor definitely <laughs> up there. It's up um, there. This question is uh, changing gears a bit, um, but asking, are there any books each of you have read and liked lately? Laura? <laughs> <laughs> um, at this moment, I'm reading um, In Search of, the entirety of In, In Search of Lost Time, uh, Bruce Jerry, massive <laughs> our book club's going to be we committed to doing this together it's going to we read 100 pages a week so it's going to take us like a literal year um but that has been my primary project um and I, I you know the last a recent book so i I, I'll recommend something that came out, a uh, book that came out recently. I really loved a collection of short stories called How to Wrestle a Girl by Vanita Blackburn. Um, it is fantastic. And also, if you um, presumably are here because you love Miriam's work and you love Fight Night, there is this also is a book that in its own way is, is very interested in um, fighting and resilience and, um, and, and finding love, you know, in connection on, on the other side of that. But yeah, I would heartily recommend, um, how to wrestle a girl. Um, and I also read for the first time recently, this too, I, I can accredit, um, with my book club, um, Bolaño's 2666, which I had never read and which is, um, an experience, like, all caps and I, I'm not even sure what to say about it beyond that but it like exploded my brain and I I'd still I think I finished it in I think we finished 266 in like May and I so so a few months ago and I I, I still just like will wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it um it's a really incredible book and and it is it just it, I think the thing that I love about the novel is how capacious the form it can be and all the different modes it can accommodate. And I feel like Bolaño used that capaciousness to its sort of like fullest degree in that, yeah, in that project. So, so those, are, those are two books that um, resonated with me recently. 2666 is one of my favorite books. I love Bolaño. It's that that lit, the, the sort yeah. of litany, you know, of um of crimes, the, the police reports and and um yeah. I mean it's just it's just earth-shattering. I read that book when I was going through a very difficult protracted divorce and um and I would read a little bit of it every night and it was probably the wrong thing, not that I mean, how can Bolaño ever be the wrong thing to read? But maybe it was the wrong thing to read <laughs> a difficult divorce. But it yeah. was, I would just read a few pages of it, and and you know, and then and then put it put it aside and and try to and try to sleep, and then do the same thing every day. And there was something um, I don't know. I mean, earth shattering and so jarring and so disturbing about it. But you know, but it was there was also because Bolaño is a great writer, you know, there, there was something that, that takes you to, it, it take, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly not a lullaby. It's the, the opposite of a lullaby. It's, it's, it's a horror show, but the way that he writes it, it just kind of lulls you into, you know, almost, you know, drags you into, into this, into this darkness, but in a, yeah. you know, in a, you know, Bolaño-esque way where you can't resist. Uh, and, um, I don't, I don't know. I, I tried, I actually, I'm such a fan of Alanya that I tried to write a story recently, um, sort of in his style for a certain um, publication. 
<laughs> sort of homage to Bolaño. Anyway, they didn't um they didn't want it. So I guess, <laughs> I, I guess this, this lesson is, you know, just to stick with, you know, writing the way you write. But uh don't try to imitate Bolaño. It's impossible. But but yeah, but yeah. Yeah. I you know it's that it would I agree. It's an and, and and it is just like one of someone in my book club was like, it's like climbing like dread mountain. Yeah. Um or yeah, but I yeah, I had that. I mean it really um but it also right is in this you know the violence is situated in this like really complex sort of network of like time and history and it's yeah it's I, I'm still I'm still like processing the experience of having read it but it yeah it, I, it, I, it was like immediately launched into my like top 10 or maybe even top five yeah the novels. Way having to be dragged into the yeah the, the desert of uh and Juarez uh, you know of uh, the desert yeah. of, of northern Mexico you know with Bolaño and his um his 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 gaze I mean his just his direct gaze his fearlessness um is um and his rage you know yeah uh yeah and it's yeah it's 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 a thrilling um a horrifying experience yeah yeah like you say it takes a long time to process any other miriam is there anything else you've read recently sorry not to put Wait, you on the spot yeah the question was yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> we're just yeah all everyone should get like 10 copies of two two six 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 <laughs> yeah it, it comes in three different chunks and um yeah I, 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 um, I've been reading a lot of Natalia Ginsburg lately, um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, and, and other, um, a few other Italian writers, and, you know, translations, just because I, I long to be in Italy, sorry, that, that sounds like, you know, so douchey, oh my god, I long to be in Italy, but I, I you know, I've been watching Italian shows and movies, oh, yeah, so it, it would be nice to go to, like, right, who wouldn't, so I've been it, reading, I, I would go to Italy tomorrow, it, yeah, I mean, it's, I know, Sounds so wonderful. In, you know, in, lieu of, in lieu of being able to go to Italy, I've been, yeah, I've been reading Natalia Ginsburg, who is also writing, you know, against, um, I mean, um, you know, she, she was writing during, you know, as, as she was part of the resistance, the Italian resistance during World War II and um, experiencing the horrors of that and, and um, the, that particular Italian fascism and, and, um, and at the same time writing these, you know, very intimate, often funny, um you could say family dramas in a sense but but um but always you know always again with that you know that sort of you, you know the that sinister idea that isn't there necessarily um you know implicitly or explicitly in the work but it's um but 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 it's there in your mind when you read it and so i just love that i love the way that she is able to to do that to to create that yeah that inner, that interior kind of domestic world, you know, and without even telling us what's going on on the outside of it, we, we know, and we feel it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, wonderful. Uh -huh. um, I, I have a couple more, I see we're getting to the top of the hour. So I think if you have like a last question for Miriam, this would be, um, a good time to to put it into the chat and i i have, I have a couple more questions for you um i was really interested in what you were saying at, this was like at, at sort of when we first started talking about how you see your books collectively is telling kind of one macro story and i was um i was thinking about fight night in in relation to your your last novel women talking and there's no shortage of suffering and loss in fight night to be sure but also there are these kind of um counter charges of like a, a, you know optimism and and joy and there's an exuberance to the book and i think maybe that that's partly because we are um in swift's pov and and it, and as and as as much difficulty as she's in there's this kind of energy and exuberance and i'm wondering if that felt like a necessary thing to access after women talking um Absolutely. which is such an incredible book and also necessarily like very 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 harrowing space to be in as a reader and i'm i'm sure it must have been so for you as a writer um and yeah if that i just i'm i think the the real question that i have is 
um, to what degree does that does the previous book impact the one that comes after? Yeah, I mean, for me, that was huge. Even just as you describe, you know, now the writing uh, of women talking, I feel, you know, short of breath and I feel, you know, like crying. It's just, I mean, carrying the pain of those women and um, that story during the writing and um, and still um, really and, and literally, and I know this sounds a little bit um, melodramatic, but I, fe- I, I, I just felt that I was, that, that that was gonna die or something, writing it or that I was, my brain was gonna, you know, just, burnout or I you know it was a it was a for me it was a very difficult book to write and a harrowing book to write it was um a harrowing you know experience and painful experience obviously for so many women and continues to be um so and to hold that you know to their their pain and and to to respect that and to uh it was um yeah so uh, so, some so so I needed to absolutely um you know to I needed to move um not not to move away from you know certain dark truths and parts of life um things questions that i always have and themes that i'm always circling around in my work but you know but i needed a different angle and i needed um like you say that exuberance um my characters yeah. in, in fight night are often on the move i mean you know swiv and grandma are always traveling around yes, and form of trans- they're moving that's they're true. talking there yeah. um you know and and there's a lot of um it was I mean, it was, it was fun to write. I mean, writing, as you know, it's kind of fun, but it's also um, not fun. <laughs> and, you know, but this book, it was a necessary, it was absolutely a necessary thing, this um, fight night to write after, after, after women talking. Yeah. 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 And I had, I was thinking more in terms of tone and the emotional palette, but I actually hadn't even thought of, you were right, like they are on the move. Um, in in small ways, and then they go on this, you know, they go on a, a trip together, and, yeah. uh, and so there. But right, there is this like elasticity of movement and this feeling of like, oh, we can just decide to go to California, and you're expelled from school anyway, so you know, yeah. you'll you'll and, come and with the, me. Yeah, and the and, freedom of that, and moving in the world, you know, and yeah. women talking. Women are confined to this loft, this right. small space, right. Right. and yeah. you know, and it, and it's and and this, it's kind of terrifying dark dark space for them to be in in every way on every level and um so yeah so that movement and that getting out um you know that that happens in in fight yeah. night yeah um we have one more thing in the chat uh this is another comment from aaron um and aaron says i have returned to women talking a couple of times since it was published and it's such a quietly explosive depth charge of a book. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. Um, thanks for reading it. <laughs> thanks yeah. for rereading it. Um, so I have a, a last um, question for you, Miriam, um, and then I think that will will be at time. Um, we were asked to talk about books that you know we've read recently that had an impact on us, and I'm I'm wondering if there were um, you know, either like works of literature or just works of art in general that were particularly important for you while you were working on um, Fight Night specifically? Well, I was working on Fight Night specifically. You know, you know, interestingly enough, or maybe it's not that interesting, <laughs> uh, you can judge for yourself that it's interesting, but I was reading a book by, um, you, you know, this the French writer, and this isn't his real name, um, and uh, it, it, his name was Julien Grac. You know, and he writes about about writing. Uh, oh, I I do not I do not know this writer. I will. Um, um, I, will look he, he, I think his real name is something else. Uh, you know, Lou, Louis. So I can't remember now. But um, but he he uses the pen name Julian Grack, and and I think he has uh, passed away. But but um, and it's all and just the way that he writes about um, writing you know and reading but but specifically you know about about writing I mean it was something that I was just so uh, I was obsessed with this book and I was uh, consumed by it and and making notes all all over the place and and um and for some reason that book was um some kind of uh necessary for me you know counter to to writing to to writing fight fight night there was a little yeah read the other book was it was a kind of a static not static experience but a kind of grounding experience and fight night was more of a um you know like oh you know let's open everything up let's 
uh, breathe. And uh, so it, it was a nice kind of, um, you know, AM, FM kind of yeah. <laughs> reading that, that particular book. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you there so much. There were other books too. There were other books yeah. too that I was reading um, while I was, uh, you know, I, I read uh, Duck's Newberry Port. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which was another book that took me so long. I just loved that book and it took me so long to read it, um, you know, because it's, it's so big. Yeah. It's so big and it's only a few sentences. Yeah. <laughs> a few very, 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 very long sentences. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I love that. I admired that, her voice and the voice of it. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much, Miriam. We like. This is, um, I, it was such a joy to get to, to talk with you. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you to the audience for being with us this evening. And I just, yeah, thank you so much for your, your insight and generosity. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And yeah, and thanks to, to the audience and to everybody at Powell's. Thanks. Very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks, Laura. It was great to um, have you be part of this event. This is Laura's book, by the way. Her latest book, anyway, I should say. Wonderfully strange, great short stories. Um, and in the chat, I just posted the link to Miriam's book, um, to Fight Night, which officially comes out tomorrow in the US. But I happen to have a um, secret copy here. That's what it looks like. Beautiful book. I'm such a big fan of Miriam's that I get so excited. And she's going to do an event here. I literally like whenever I hear about Miriam's uh, a new book, you know, I, I scream. So I'm screaming and jumping. Um, I love it so much. Um, I'm also going to paste in the chat a link to our YouTube channel, and you can click on that. Um, all our events are recorded, and this event will probably be going up uh, tomorrow, probably in the afternoon. So if you have friends that missed it or you want to watch it again, uh, feel free to uh, go to our YouTube page and check it out. Um, Laura, Miriam, everyone at home, it was such a great night. And uh, Miriam, I can't wait to see you in Portland again sometime. <laughs> That'd be nice. Thank when you. And this is all over. I'll be there. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And hope to see you too, Laura. I hope to see you at, at Palace. Yeah, I'm so excited to go Next places book. again. <laughs> when, when things yeah. are normal again. Yeah. yeah. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye, -bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night.